Hey everybody, David Chang here and welcome to another episode of The Art of Thinking Smart where we learn to live and think smarter lives. Now today's guest, I'm very excited. I've had him before and just because of so much interesting stuff that we can learn from him. Uh, I have Michael North and his wife, Xiaofang Joe North. And both of them are co-founders of Asia Pacific Group. So they do quite a bit of business in China and also the co-founders of the Zhou Enlai Peace Institute, which I do want to spend a small segment talking about who Zhou Enlai was and what the Peace Institute does. The topic of today's show is doing business in China and tips for success and why it's so important to do so. Even if you are a small entrepreneur uh, in your hometown or even just kind of being a manager or an employee of a business, why is it important to learn about global infrastructure cultures and especially China? And one of the th key things I think we all know, China is the largest country in the world with over 1.3 billion people and their growth has been phenomenal and they are now the second largest economy in the world. So they overtook Japan just a few years ago and at their current growth rate it's only a matter of years that they probably will overtake the United States when it comes to the size of their economy. So today I do want to talk about how the world is becoming a smaller place and as a result of it with internet with technology it's very important that we understand other cultures particularly China because they are a major kid on the block and it's very important that we take them seriously and learn about our uh, uh, partners and about the Chinese people and their culture just as though we would want them to learn about us so Mike thanks for coming on the show I really appreciate it Right. And then also thanks for Xiaofang being there. And what I want to first do is, is before we get into the China side, I, I want to little go back in a little bit of history and talk about Zhou Enlai. I love history and I studied him and, and I think he's a marvelous person. And for those that don't know who Zhou Enlai is, he was the premier, second in command of China back when Mao Zedong was the ruler of China uh, after the Communist Revolution uh, 1949 all the way up into the early 70s when he passed away. And he's also known for the ping pong diplomacy where if you ever see the movie Forrest Gump and you see the him going back and forth when he's in China, uh, Joe and Liza want to started that and was credited with a lot of stuff. So Mike, maybe if you want to just spend a few moments of talking about who is Joe and Lai, why is he an important figure for people to know about, and why you created the Joe and Lai Peace Institute? Yeah, we created the Joe and Lai Peace Institute because we felt that there was a need for people to be able to understand China from inside to China, not just statistics and numbers and pictures and, and images, impressions, the kind of thing that we get from the news and so on, but something of the character of a people. You know, if, if I wanted to introduce the best of America to someone who had never been here and who didn't understand anything about America, I would say, study Abraham Lincoln. Hmm. I would say, study Martin Luther King. Right. Even just between those two personalities, their history, their accomplishments, their challenges, their tragedies, you can understand so much more about America than if all you do is watch Baywatch, right? <laughs> right, right. Which, by so the way, the Chinese love doing, Baywatch. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are doing the equivalent of watching Baywatch when we form impressions about China. Superficial, right? But if you want to get inside, then go to the hero that they respect the most, who helped change China from really almost a medieval culture mm. just a little bit more than a hundred years ago into the fast-moving modern state that it is today. And he was not only a leader of, of uh, political and military and technology and education and medical, he was a leader of the heart. He was a leader of the conscience of mm. China. He was He's respected not only for what he did to launch China in the future, but for the way that he connected the best of China's past, from the Taoist and the Confucian past and the Buddhist tradition to today. Hmm. And 
people respect him for the conscience and the openness, for the compassion, for his elegance and education, for his humor, and for the way that he always worked with the ordinary people of China. He regarded himself and conducted himself like the poorest Chinese peasant. And when he passed away, he had a couple of old pairs of pants and a worn pair of shoes and a couple of shirts and some glasses that were probably broken. But he was the premier of the country. Right, he right. He took nothing with him, you know, and, and he said, don't remark on me, don't bury me, don't have any monuments, I don't want a tomb. He, he had the soul of the ordinary people, sort of in the same way that, that Lincoln did and that Dr. King did for America. So I, I want to turn this question over to Joe Chalpin, who's the, she's the co-founder of the Joe and Mai Beach Institute. And since she's from Beijing, and she's from China, she knows China from the inside, she can maybe give you uh, an even deeper, uh, more educated insight into yeah, your question. Yeah, that would be great. And to also note that uh, she is related to Joe and Lai, so that also is very helpful that she has, uh, has uh, uh, internalized a lot of the values that Joe and Lai had. And, yeah. and for our listeners and those watching the show, I think they, if you do uh, understand history a little bit, China during the 50s, 60s, and 70s went through some difficult time periods with the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, where many of those educated the business people, those that were professors, were systematically purged. And Zhou Enlai, even though he's second in command, he was the one who protected a lot of those people. And in fact, he himself almost was purged. Uh, but because of you know his relationships that he had with people, he was able to uh, save himself. But uh, those are I would love to hear from Xiao Fang. I love just kind of the story she has about him and the great things that he okay. did. Okay, I'm going to pass the phone to Xiao Fang now for a moment. Aloha, David. Hey, Xiao Fang, how, how are you today? Thank you for being on our show. And we're we're yeah. just talking about uh, a few minutes of Zhou Enlai, and before we get into our topic of doing business in China and tips for success, because I think it's very important for us to understand someone like Zhou Enlai to have a better view of, of working with the Chinese and what he represents. And so if you can give us a few minutes of, uh, of what he meant to the Chinese people and why you created the Peace Institute, uh, the Zhou Enlai Peace Institute. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, you know, so when you mention Joe and Lai, the name, in China, anywhere, regardless, in a taxi or hotel or on the street, everybody, they just put their hand in their heart. Mm. And uh, this is how people feel, um, remembering him, not Yes, he is the first premier of China. He is the, also first ministry, uh, foreign minister. But he is also um, like uncle, like a father mm. to to the people. He has no offspring. He has no children. Um, but he adopted so many orphans during oh. the war. And uh, he is uh, really deeply not just respect, but loved by the people of China. Mm, mm. So um, I was shooting the documentary, follow the footsteps of Joe and Lai, um, the year before, and I will continue to go following his footsteps because his footsteps is all over China, all over the world, except America. Mm. So, you know, the reason for us to um, create the uh, Joe and Lai Peace Institute like what Michael just said, we we really like to bring the family value, regardless of the uh, politics, the cultural differences, but family. Mm. You know, the common goal, the common interest. And we could, John Lai wants to say, you know, the coexistence. Um, and now it's the 21st century, we really need a co, not only co-existence, but collaboration. 
Mm. It's so important. And through all our ancestors, you know, the battle, the, the war, uh, the death, the blood shed it for freedom, for peace. Got it. And this, yeah, this has to be continued, not just for China, for America, for people, for humanity. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why, the, you know, the, the backbone of the, uh, uh, the Peace Institute, Got the Joe Lai as a, as a channel, you know, do what he did, what he did for the people uh, of China, for the people of the, uh, you know, to the world. Uh, we really need, this is our journey. Got this it. is our time. And this is our responsibility to continue to carry their legacy and do what we got to do. Got it. No, thank you so much, Alfong. Really do appreciate it. It's good. And, and those listening and watching, you can go to ZhouEnLaiPeaceInstitute.org. So Zhou Enlai is his name, uh, the first premier of China, and Institute.org to get more information. And now what I want to do is, is now switch gears a bit and talk about doing business in China and the importance of, of understanding the Chinese and why it's so important for us to do so. So, Mike, are you there right now? Uh, Michael, you want to talk to Michael? Yes, please. Oh, okay. Hello, David. Hey, what's up, Mike? So, yeah, wanted yeah. to now circle back about talking about doing business in China. And uh, we've talked about, well, you know, 1.3 billion people. It's growing. It's the second largest economy. It'll soon be the largest. And, and with yeah. the Chinese having purchasing power. So you founded the uh, uh, Asia Pacific Group with, um, yeah. uh, with a variety of other folks. And so what I wanted to do is just touch on briefly, okay, if somebody is thinking about, I want to go global, and I understand the importance of going global, how do I start? Now, the Chinese have a certain culture, and unlike us Americans where uh, things are done in a very business-like, very professional, get it done as quick as you can manner, the Chinese are very much into patience, time, let's get to know each other. So maybe if you want to spend a few moments to talk about what are the cultural differences between the Chinese and Americans, uh, and, and what is it that Americans need to know about when doing business in China? Okay. Here is a really simple decoder ring. It's very simplified, so don't take it as the final answer. This is <laughs> okay. a one-dimensional one, but here is one thing that I know you've noticed, David. Americans begin with business. They begin with the transaction. They begin with the deal. I am you. I am this. I have that. You want this. Let's make a deal. Here's the price. Where's the order? Let's start up the relationship. And that makes things work. After there's established a commercial relationship, mm. then Americans like to make friends. They mm. like to go out to dinner. They like to uh, meet family, perhaps, over a period of years. They like to exchange emails, you know, see each other on a vacation with very mature relationships. You know, so business turns into personal mm. for mm. America. Try to imagine doing that exactly opposite. 180 degrees opposite. So you begin with, hello, who are you? Where is your family from? How are you? What's your, what do you care about? What's the most important thing to you? Mm. What is the reason you're in business? Where are you going? Let's have dinner. Let's have a lunch. Let's meet each other's friends. Let's develop a relationship first. Maybe the relationship involves a little bit of baijiu, you know, that... Uh, that lightning. Thai liquor. Yeah, the yes. liquor, right, maybe, right. <laughs> maybe it's a little green tea, but it's, it's an experience that you give yourself to without asking for anything in return. Got it. And without talking business, without talking numbers, without talking, I've got this, this is the price, let's make a deal. No, if you do that too soon in a relationship with Chinese, you kill... The relationship that's it done so so they really it's just like you know dating somebody you don't want to just propose uh -huh. without getting to know that's them right. you want to spend the time to date them get to know yes. who they are and then after a relationship is established then move into that next step in the relationship then then the deal happens then a deal happens Out of its natural course right Got it. but yeah. it doesn't happen you can't force it 
you can't put a deadline on it. Um, if you try to hurry it, you slow it down. Mm-hmm. If you push it too much, then it disintegrates in front of you. If you chase it, it runs away. Got it. <laughs> right? Got it. So yeah, that, that is sense. a really key difference. And I would say if if someone is, let's say we have a young entrepreneur running a business in Hawaii looking to build their presence in a global market, and I would say go to websites of local Chinese organizations. Mm. You can go to joeandlifepeaceinstitute.org. That's a good place to start. Got it. But there, there's the Chinese Chamber. Go to the website of the of DBED, um, the, the state website. They very often sponsor um, trips, uh, trade development trips to China. They form a delegation. And these are done very carefully with mayors and with uh, with uh, with state uh, ministers and so on, with with representatives and senators. So, and it doesn't cost anything for you to participate, other than mm. the cost of your airline ticket. But those things happen on a pretty regular basis Got out it. of Honolulu. So the biggest if you can get tuned into one of those, because my first my first uh, advice is you got to go. Got it. So the, the first thing is, is is learning about it. Obviously, you can learn about China through books, through talking about it, but it's important to actually experience it. And one yeah. of the best ways that you're saying to experience it is to go with people who are familiar with it, just like a trade group, a chamber of yeah. commerce, any type of organization, and establish yeah. that relationship beforehand. Now, if somebody yeah. is looking to crack into uh, they uh, uh, okay. They obviously we have a global business uh, world today, and really business. You know, people could do it from their own home with their phone because very mobile. Uh, how does somebody? Yeah, okay, they go to China, they meet some people. How would you say that they get started on establishing a business, and how should they structure it to prepare themselves for the future? Engineer to be global from the very beginning. Okay, what does that and, mean? And that means, and that means mobile. Okay. Everything, all your communications have to be have to look good, function well, on mobile, and they have to be multilingual mm. so that you can switch languages. Um, it's pretty easy to do with several of the big uh, content development platforms out there, like WordPress and Joomla. They have multilingual capability built into them. Or as plugin, and Google has a has a, an amazing translation service that if you just go to translate.google.com, you can put in any language pair you want. You can put in English to Chinese, Chinese to English. It has Hindi, it has Urdu, it has German, French, and Spanish, and a lot of languages you may never have heard of. Mm-hmm. But in this case, we're talking about Chinese. You can not only translate a word or a sentence. You can translate an entire web page if you just paste the URL of a Chinese website. You'll get a rough translation into English. You can use it, you need to read through Google's documentation, but you can use the Google API to turn your website into a quick multilingual site, so that you don't actually have to do the translation. Google will do it for you on the fly. Got it. So you get to save money um, there, time by doing that, and so that's yeah. I think extremely important is having you know before right, everyone had to learn English, but now it's it's a matter of us being able to take that step forward and saying okay, you know what, uh, we want to learn Chinese and be able to uh, meet the Chinese halfway and making sure that all of our materials are are translate so they can read it. Now, just kind of yeah. uh, switching gears a little bit, you know, you're in China a lot. I've traveled there with you. We've met quite a few people, and, and yeah. there's just so many opportunities. I uh, want to talk about what kind of, uh, what, what do you think is the opportunity uh, of, of the future? If somebody's looking or if they're in a business and, and is looking to kind of start a new branch or, or say, you know what, we want to do business in China because we know that's the future, what type of industries do you recommend looking at or doing research on? The fastest growing international industries 
in China right now are all the sharing applications. So all the derivatives of of uh, uh, of eBay and so on. Mm. You know all the all the different ways that people have of sharing resources, like sharing rides, sharing bicycles um, through social media. Those are extremely hot and growing very fast, not only in mainland China, but in all of Asia. So anybody who has an application that allows for sharing, and there's an application that allows you to share umbrellas. Got it. You know, they're, they're going really deep and wide. Not all of them are working, of course. You know, there's a certain amount of garbage in, garbage out. But the, the jewels in that sharing distributed access economy are extremely valuable. And if you have something to add to that, if you can participate in that, that is huge. Another area that is huge, very influential right now in China is artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So anything that needs, that can look at a large amount of what you call big data and break it down, analyze it into human understandable uh, bytes and communicate in in natural language, you know, whether it be English or Chinese, with people is extremely valuable. Um, so when you come to agriculture information, um, forestry and mining information, when you come to health information, um, anything that you have that can, any technology that you have that can work in those fields is extremely valuable. Got it, got it. Okay, no, that's great. So, uh, understanding that uh, the different industries in China, obviously, is, is very important, and, and you yeah. see that big growth uh, they have there. Now, what are some of the uh, precautions that people should have? You know, you've heard, you know, back 20 years ago when uh, the uh, law or, or some of the, the uh, rules and regulations weren't as strict as they are now, you had some issues of corruption or some counterfeit items, goods. What would you say is, is a, uh, uh, something that people should be aware of when doing business in China and how to protect themselves? <laughs> You know, there's hustlers in China just like there's hustlers in Times Square, right? right? It's a universal blessing that mankind has everywhere you go. I don't care whether you're in Mumbai or Massachusetts, it's always there. So watch out for Chinese people who act like Americans. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> who want to yeah. come in and hustle you, right? They're okay. carpetbaggers, they have something, let's make a deal, let's do this. Pay me an upfront fee, pay me a consulting fee, just pay me a retainer, and I'll bring you all my friends and all the good business. Oh, no, okay. no, 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 no. We've, we've seen that game be run both here uh, in America and in China. No, you want to you want to speak to real established business people that you can track their origin, you can see their face, you can know people that they know and you're introduced in that dignified way that I was trying to characterize earlier, right? Got They're it. not running after you, and they don't like to be chased. Those are the people that you want to deal with, the people of principle. And I would say also in China, understand how they see the world. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, America, for the last hundred years or so, we've seen the world as our economic playground. Right? especially since World War II, so 75 years ago. We've seen Europe and Asia and Africa and all, all the continents of the world as a place for our multinational corporations to go and establish businesses, set up factories, do manufacturing, do distribution. You know, we, we sell Tide soap and we sell Starbucks and so on everywhere across the planet. And America has a kind of a we-own-it kind of uh, psychology, right. which is not all bad, you know. The world appreciates America's inventive genius and our enterprise. But China, which is coming up the curve to be able to do the kind of things that America has done, is not doing things the same way. They mm. are not. They are China. They're not America, and they don't want to be America. Got it. They don't want to copy America. They don't see America as the standard to emulate. They see America as a series of lessons. Some right. of them are positive, some maybe not so much. And they take them those lessons in a very thoughtful way. 
in a dialogue sort of way. Got so it. what they see from the consequences of America having done what what feels like economic exploitation in some countries, you know, the multinational, right, the, right. The, the, the bad aspects of globalization, the unfortunate aspects of globalization, which watch, then they wash back onto our shores as well. They see that as something that they are not going to do. Got and it. there's here, here's a phrase for everybody who's listening to put into your Google Master, and that is one belt, one road. Mm. You may not know what it is, but if you type in one belt, comma, one road, you will see tens of thousands of citations of this new policy that started about four years ago, but it's an extension of trends that were begun 40 years ago. Got it, got um, it. And the idea of one belt, one road is China is investing in productive ways in all the economies of the world. Right. They want to be at the center, you know, for example, in, in India, they want to be at the center of economic development in India and have trusted relationships with everyone. So they're putting hundreds of millions, billions of dollars into the power infrastructure of India. Right, and I think, so that you know what, that's... electricity everywhere. Uh, as much as, you know, I think we could have another show on the One Belt, One Road. Uh, uh, I think for those that are listening, watching, that's something definitely to, to do some research on. And, and I think that's something that we should probably revisit. But Mike, I want to thank you and Xiao Fong. I, I think it's important for us that we know that, okay, you know what, Zhou Enlai is one of the most important figures in China and understanding him and what you've done to really spread uh, knowledge about him and, and the work that he's done. And also coming back to, you know what, China is a major player to work with and what we're looking to do is learn about their local culture, their customs, and make sure that you work with those on the ground visit to uh, do business in China. And uh, you know, we yeah. have to end the show here. I, I want to thank you again, Mike and Xiao Fong, for being on here. And I want to thank those that have watched and listened. And I look forward to seeing you on our next show for The Art of Thinking Smart, where we all learn to think and live smarter lives. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.